following video was filmed at a recent field day hosted by Northwest Local Land Services and Heart Rural, with support through the Regional Land Partnerships Agriculture Program through funding from the Australian Government's National Land Care Program. Due to COVID-19, we could only have 20 people attend. However, there was a lot of interest in attending this field day. As a result, the following video was compiled, which runs for 60 minutes. This video is of Dr Rob Banks describing a soil pit. Soil is the most important asset you have on your farm. Knowing what soil you have, its characteristics and its limitations are important to how you manage your pastures and crops. Hi, I'm Rob Banks. Um, I'm a soil scientist and a soil consultant. I've worked in the northwest for about 32 years, um, helping people to see all the qualities of their soil. And uh, a lot of times you can't see those unless you dig a hole and jump into them. And sometimes the land management from the past or the current land management you know, affects the way the soil looks on the surface and certainly the way it's producing. So until you understand what your soil resource is deep down and how to use that, uh, it's very, it's, it's, it's quite a challenge to, to manage land. And I, I think field days like this give people an opportunity to think about how much more water they can put in their soil, how better they can manage their system, and at the same time, probably produce better. Basically, we looked at one uh, cropping site and um, there's some serious structural decline issues there from compaction and uh, probably from a history of loosen growing in that paddock. So the moisture going into the soil um, and being used by plants was quite limited. So the production was really limited to um, rainfall um, feeding the top few centimetres of soil. The second site we saw um, was tropical pasture growing established in the drought. So it wasn't you know, the most fantastic example, but um, in the next few years as that thickens up, we could see already that the soil had changed, that the structure had improved significantly, and that moisture was being stored deeper in the profile. And as that system drives itself and roots get down a couple of metres, that soil will really open up and enhance that production by storing at least five times more water than it would have under the first profile. And then the third profile, which I'm standing next to now, is native pasture that's in the process of being renovated because it's had African lovegrass invade it. So they pasture cropped it and grown some oats to have some feed. And it's interesting um, because it's got a history of permanent pasture, the soil here is really open and, um, and uh, has the ability to store water to great depth. Um, if it transitions to tropical pasture, then those pastures will be able to use that, that moisture and structure at great depth. Um, but the risk for all three of these soils is, is structural decline. And the solution to um, getting plants to do well in this environment and to produce well is to get as many roots um, into the soil as possible and down as deep as possible. And that facilitates great water storage which feeds your plants for longer. The plants are laying down more <laughs> organic matter and helping look after the surface structure of the soil. So I've had, had a fair bit of experience in working with soils, often difficult ones, um, although sometimes, you know, even some of the most perfect soils that I've, I've seen in the world have, have issues that typical agronomy can't just solve. Um, the soils in the Horton Valley a lot of the clay minerals here are sort of um, 60 to 200 million years old. You're looking at soils in North America that are 16,000 years old. It's very, very, very difficult to compare. It's not very often you get to sort of go down this deep and see what the soil structure is doing. I, I guess this soil may have been a, a nice self-mulching vertisol at one stage, but at some stage either after white fellas have arrived or long before that it's had this silty layer deposit over the top. So um, the problem with, with um, silty stuff um, agronomically is it's very easy to um, 
to pound all of the pores out of it. So you end up with stuff like this. Um, and it's very hard for rich to grow. See how they're growing sideways through it? They're finding little tiny, um, little tiny um, pore spaces or, or, or even just some fracture, fractures from uh, machinery traffic or what have you. A lot of them are going sideways. You can break it any which way you, you like, but you should be able to see lots of holes there, and there's there's very very few holes in it. And the problem with um, silt is when, once you wet it, you get the air out of it. It just packs down. It's um, it's a really good additive to cement because it helps fill all of those pore spaces, and um, and then you'll you'll see yeah. So so. Um, once you've taken the pore spaces out of it, it's a bit of a challenge for a plant. And obviously we've had fantastic, fantastic seasons for a little while, which has been great. And um, you know, you can, you can grow crops with robust seeds in this because they've got a fairly big store of energy. When it gets wet, it'll um, disperse like the bottom of a good dam. That's what you want, that nice slimy layer that fills up all the gaps. And that'll really restrict water penetration. And if you have a look here, it's only where there's really good cracks um, through the subsoil that the roots have gone down in any mass into it. And so even though there's a, there's a lot of moisture in this, like quite a lot of moisture, it's having a hard time getting it out. As you go down the pit, there's quite a bit of moisture as well, but it, it's less. And um, even though it's almost workable, the problem with heavy clay soils is they have an enormous water holding capacity before it's available to plants. So if you take a sand, for example, and you put water on it, you have, you have two things going. You have, a, um, you have what's called an available water band. So difference between saturation and drowning a plant and a plant being unable to suck water out of it is the difference between saturation and what's called wilting point. A wilting point in a sand is about 1%, 2% moisture. And um, so all the, moisture, all the moisture that falls on the sand is available to the plant. Wilting point in this stuff is about 30 or 40% moisture. So it can, it can be qu quite moist, but plants can't suck it hard enough to get the moisture out. The main issues here are probably um, structural. Um, if you were in Germany, they love silty stuff because it, organic matter builds up it and everything. But uh, we're in Australia. <laughs> uh, once your annual average temperature gets above about 20 degrees, you're burning organic matter. And uh, if you're if you're in Northern Europe, all you need to do is um, farm it, throw out a bit of dung, and your air horizon will get deeper and deeper. So I've seen stuff like this in Europe, where um, this sort of material um, ends up as being a two metre deep A horizon after 200 years, 300 years. Um, we don't have that um, opportunity here, particularly not in a cropping system, because your production from your plants is too limited. It's too short. You're not having, there's no perenniality in this soil that's driving an organic matter build up to to address that structure in a, in a cropping scenario. Yeah. So in relation to when I'm recommending lime, mm. obviously I'm, not, I'm going to back it off to what I'm meant to be doing because the roots you hope will get down to that yeah. and go from there. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, in a cropping situation you might use, might need lime to kick it off. Yeah. Um, and for pasture as well or not really? Uh, well, with a the, with the pasture they're pretty tolerant. Um, you may, if it's really acid and you want to grow something that's not console love grass, which is a, yeah. a poor performing tropical, it's yeah. still quite good, but you know, if you want to use something that produces more food, generally, um, they probably like a slightly more neutral start. Once they access that, they'll start cycling it yeah. and they'll, they'll do it quite well. You can see. This is really interesting. So that, that bleached layer, that little A2 horizons, had everything washed out of it. That pH there now is about four. Yeah. So it's pretty acid. Mm. Yeah. And um, so you 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 you've probably got a um, a water. Well, you've definitely got a waterlogging effect because we can see that in that bleached layer. And you may well have an acidity effect there when it's wet.
Yeah. Yeah. It shows up in the soil test. Yeah. yeah. And the other side was now uh, nitrogen. Everyone's going about fertiliser and so on. But at that lower level, we were down to 1%. Mm. Uh, was that to be expected, or is it something we should be concerned about because there's no reserves left? Um, I can't really answer that. That's I'm, okay. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, I, I think most of your end nutrition is really responsive in the in the top with 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 um, crops. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and and a lot of it's just going to come in from your near surface roots anyway. But um, yeah, yeah that's um, and that's right. uh, and. Um, <laughs> I guess there's slightly more persistent types of nitrogen that a lot of people are trying, trying, um, yeah, chook poo and that sort of stuff these days. It often doesn't do much in the first year, and then you, because it, a lot of it's bound to organic matter, it sort of releases over a bit further time. But um, yeah, if you need it now, you need it now. Mm. Mm. That's a thought. Here's a bit of the old stuff. It's still hard, but most of it wow. has all these roots. You'll still find hard bits because. As you say, there's 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 a hard well hardish bit there. There's another hard bit. It, the, the pasture's had a hard life and it's not very old, yeah. which is also why the roots aren't going fabulously deep. But they are going down. If there was a bleach day too, if there was a bleach layer here like there was over there, it's gone. No longer water ponding on top of that bee horizon. May still be sodic, may still be a bit sodic, but it's not a problem in the pasture. Yeah. And you'll notice that where you had these big domey things over there, you can still see there's a, a bit of a remnant of that larger structure in this soil, but it actually breaks apart to, to much, much, much smaller pieces. And there's, there's roots not just going on the surfaces of the soil aggregates, they're going straight through them as well. So they're getting their nutrients and water not just from the surfaces of the big bits, they're going into it. So your moisture storage capacity in this has been enhanced by the roots creating that porosity. And, um, and you'll see that... Um, this subsoil is still a pretty heavy coat. We'll get it where it's um, been smashed and by the machines. Get a bigger machine. Get a bigger one. It's got lots of little shiny surfaces on it. And that's from where the soil's been made to shrink and swell across itself as it wets and dries. And um, so that means it's it's one of those soils that shrinks and swells and loose and can do damage to, oh, yeah. right? So, but even so, that that's that's like that big lump because of smear. But even so, I can still break quite small pieces out of it. And um, if you um, if you go and excavate some of these tropicals, you find that their root mass is is. Yeah, well, there's one here too. Just there's there's what this one here. It's not a ryegrass. Just checking. <laughs> <laughs> and you've got an abundance of roots around there. You've got deeper vendicious roots going all the way to the bottom. They're coming out right there. Um, over time, I'd expect that that root mass to extend to about 50 centimetres in that big ball, and then a lot more. Of Roots going down um, as far as two metres and utilising the whole profile. So, what we're looking at is um, hasn't rained much when it was put in, hasn't had a chance to take off really yet. Mm -hmm. And um, if we sort of get another uh, another full season or two in here, this paddock's going to go gangbusters mm -hmm. because you'll, you'll be storing the whole profile full of moisture and you'll, you'll be producing a lot more dry matter than you can with other pastures so, and, um, and fairly high protein. So it'll be going really well. But you can see that it's actually repaired the soil. It's, it's really opened it up. And where those fibrous roots stop 
and you follow the, the smaller roots down, even down there, they're actually opening up the soil. You can pull small bits out. You've still got the large structure. There it is there. It's been broken up into things that if I didn't have COVID hands from not doing soil, I'd be able to pull them out. <laughs> um, it's been broken up into really quite small pieces, roots inside and outside. And that's the, um, I would expect that this profile would open up like that to at least a, a metre fifty. Um, so there's, yeah, like I said, it's a feedback mechanism. The roots create the pores, which create more moisture storage. The roots follow the moisture storage and so on and so forth. And they've just got the capacity to do that, these tropicals. So it's actually a great pit. It's a really good pit to have a look at it and see what it does. So is there any way of enhancing the roots this summer by letting it get really high before you graze it? Or yeah, I would. And that to get the roots right down there. Yes, yeah, yeah. Rule of thumb with um, the tropicals is your yeah, roots are at least at least as um, deep as your height, um, plus about half. With the natives, it's often less than the height. Um, part of the reason for that is a lot of our more palatable, grazable natives were wiped out with the first 10 million sheep that walked across them. Mm -hmm. and, um, and also, we really don't have a grazing history in Australia and people say, well, what about kangaroos? Well, um, you go back through the history of the last glacial period and the vegetation before that, most of the fauna that we had were browsers and a lot of wallabies and very few kangaroos. So it wasn't until the last glacial maximum when this area became a bit more arid and after which there was no megafauna left for the blackfellas to eat, so they started started burning to encourage open areas, to encourage kangaroos. So lots of kangaroos in the environment um, are a relatively new thing in terms of in terms of the evolution of our pastures. They used to be something that was um, not as common and um, they've really gotten away um, you know really in recent times in terms of the evolution of the, the native pastures. So, that and the fact that, you know, DPI and what have you really has never done any good work on native pastures to developing cultivars that produce more and, and that tolerate grazing better, I think. You know, in, in some some cases the horse has bolted a bit there. There's nothing wrong with natives and uh, I think they do really well in conjunction with tropicals. So I've got um, clients who keep a third of their place under natives. And when they're grazing their tropicals, they always have a gate open between these paired paddocks because quite often the tropicals are a bit soft and a bit rich and they'll go into the natives to get some, to get some fibre. And um, yeah, so that, that, the, the use of this stuff doesn't mean wipe out everything else for, for a lot of people in their farm plants. If you use them together, they're quite productive. Um, the only thing I'd say with this is... Um, Legumes, legumes, legumes. I'd be um, probably drilling the top. It's in interesting when I work on the tablelands, I've been on properties that have been aerially supered for 50 years. And they go, how much super do we put on? You've got about 700 years of reserves there. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the problem is they've acidified things, the legumes and the pastures aren't growing real well and so on and so forth. Um, there's 112 or 117 different types of phosphorus in the soil. Three of them are available. Um, but it would seem that the more uh, diverse and lively your plants are, with your legumes and your grasses and what have you, that there are bacterial assemblages that start moving that unavailable phosphorus into the plant. So um, if you come from somewhere near Tannerfield and you ask me how much super you can put on. So why don't you just dig up your place and sell it down here so you can throw it around. Yeah. You know, um, so I, and, and some of the best operators with tropical grasses have, have put phosphorus on twice in um, 30 or 40 years. 
and um, and that's been sufficient to drive the leg in. So it's it's not something that I'd be it's something that'd be high on my priority list if it was low to start with, and then um, be interesting to see what kicks along afterwards. Yeah. You know, um, and the, the I, I think the days of annually putting on something are beyond most of us anyway. Mm. Did you find with your work with the tropicals? Because um, one of the issues here, we've got potassium binding, because tropicals are related to soil. Yep. Like um, here, with our brands, the ones that have got potassium in them, and like, tropicals go off their nut. Um, they, they just explode. Because mm. potassium, um, phosphorus and sulphur are minor things. Yep, yep, yep. Um, now that's interesting, because potassium is um, the main component of stem material. And um, oh, this, I'll tell you a quick story about potassium from the Liverpool Plains. There's a lot of places adjacent to Karuna Feedlot and the bigger Kalani Feedlot down near Karindai where they were harvesting, harvesting crops and then baling all of their stubble to go to the feedlot. Whole lot, whole kit and caboodle, they will leave this much standing. Um, then what happened one year, there were three properties next to each other where beautiful season, nothing grew. Everything germinated and went back high and keeled over. They'd mined out their entire available potassium from their cation exchange suite. Potassium is something that you don't have to put on it in huge quantities. Um, but if it's limiting, I'd put it on. The Bambatsi particularly is limited by... by um, potassium yeah. it'll grow on a rock if it's got potassium in it yeah. and um be wary of that so particularly if you, if you start to bale this stuff or anything like that be aware that 90 percent of all of your so so soil available potassium is in this it's in your standing dry matter and a bit in your roots and that's okay normally because your cattle are eating it and defecating <coughs> it out and what have you. And mm. Even in the old days of burning, most of it would stay in place as a type of potash if it didn't rain and wash it away. But um, yeah, particularly if, you, if you're taking dry matter off or if the area has a history of taking dry matter off through baling loosen or anything like that, potassium is crucial. The solution to these guys, instead of putting on a few hundred kilos of pota uh, potassium per hectare, they had to go to 10 tonnes per hectare for five years to get the potassium back into the exchange suite. So if you've ever looked at a cation exchange capacity, it's got you know, potassium, magnesium, calcium and aluminium. And, and I missed one. Anyway, doesn't matter. And their, their cations, their metallic ions that are bound um, loosely to organic matter through an electrical attraction and loosely to clay particles through an electrical attraction. And, um, and it, it, it's a generic measure of soil fertility, how much of these essential metals or, or potentially toxic metals are there and how they affect root growth and that sort of thing. Because the plants need potassium, they need magnesium, they need calcium, they don't need aluminium, which is why we measure it, because if it's too high, it's a problem. Now the um, problem, once you take take it out, take potassium out of that little electron cloud around the organic matter at clay, is all the others just fill the hole. So we end up with like, it's like a little galaxy of stuff. <laughs> and um, and you have to really push it hard to get potassium back into that exchange suite. The rest of it's just leaching through the soil or going directly to a planet. Really, really hard to get back. So if you've got low potassium, for heaven's sakes, deal with it now. It's something that um, once you reach a certain point, you probably won't have to deal with much at all, unless you're harvesting your dry material. But if it's low, deal with it now. That's um, yeah. well, What's an application rate for potassium out here? Well, um, we've got two issues. Number one, um, we actually have so much, you probably uh, wouldn't have come up with a soil test, but we actually got so much potassium we actually need to So when we put an application down um, from a commercial point of view, um, what is it, 13, so 26 units of, of K and about the same in nitrogen and mm. about 8 units of P 
or about the same of S with the blend because we're growing, as I said, 10 to 15 tonnes of dry matter. Yep. And because it's being bound by the soil, um, and we're allowing for um, lock up to some mm. degree with the nitrogen, mm. so we're getting carryover. Mm. So I'm hoping that in time, yeah. we'll start to get a, a bonus. Yeah, good. Yeah. yeah. No, that's, uh, yeah. And, and, and you'll, you'll see it just in the vigour of this stuff. Yeah. It, it, and if it starts being um, eaten, turned into dung, um, you know, growing, dying, composting on the surface, etc., etc. It's gonna adjust. That's a, that's a really handy thing that I just put my hand on there. <laughs> um, because it shows you, look at all the aggregates that this plant has made through its root structure. You compare that with over there where you've got limited roots because it's, you know, cropping. Yeah. That, that has opened it up incredibly. So you can you can pull out millions of tiny tiny pets. Pass it around. I like that. That's, that's straight to the pool room that one. <laughs> so are they still selling their stubble to the feedlots? Those farmers? Ah uh, no, no. But it was a lesson for everyone else. Mm -hmm. A lot of other people were just right on the cusp and could get away with small amounts of K. Yeah. And that was fine. But um, these these people, well, people didn't realise it. They were mining it, and um, it's not something that people, you know, potassium is generally not limiting on the black soil plains, but they just got rid of the lot. So, <laughs> yeah. so do you, um, when you were saying earlier about you know, fixing nitrogen with our lead gang, yeah. do we get the same fixations for a native trefoil as what we do with um, introduced clovers? No, any near as much. Okay. Um, uh, and, and again, that's sort of a look at your above ground production and why it, yeah. your below ground root masses and what have you. Um, plus, um, you know, good inoculants and things. Yeah. Okay. And it's probably again because we we understand more about this introduced stuff than we do about our natives. And um, I was um, you know paddock the other day that we were pulling up some um, arrow leaf and some of the trefoils and what have you and the um, arrow leaf had nodules on it like peas and uh, the nodules yeah, wow. on the trefoil is probably point, point 0.5 mil. Okay. So they're just their nitrogen fixing capacities and they're really just yeah. no one's worked on them but yeah. you know, help it out. So they just, just so much of it this time of year isn't it? Like it's just um, Mm. Stuff mm. Oh, look, it all, it's, it's all helpful. Yeah, you know, yeah. Mm. Like, um, we're just looking at one way you can manage this yeah, land, yeah. you know, and yeah. certainly um, tropicals are very beneficial for restoring structure, uh, for increasing your water water storage and and uh, increasing your, your production capacity with stock. Mm. But uh, there's other reasons, there's other reasons not to do it as well. You know. Rob? Coming back to a commercial sense, yeah. the difference between these two paddocks is chalk and cheese. Yeah. So from a commercial sense where we're looking at a cropping rotation, really for us to maintain the structure without screwing it up, how long could we crop it for? What sort of period in time if we had to from commercial If you sense? wanted to crop this? Yeah. Oh gee, not very long. Two or three years. Right. Because, of course, it's a system that's being fed by the plants. Yeah. Take the plants away, you're really going to knock it around fairly quickly. Yeah. But um, I mean, that's, for whatever reason, the Manila district had um, a lot of soil like this, but it was very, very friable on the surface when um, white fillers moved in. And there's a 1901 ag journal photo of this guy with his hand up to his elbow in the topsoil. He'd just gone look like that. And um, that's you know, the reason why Manila was the richest small town in the Southern hemisphere for a short time, because it just grew stuff like steam, but once all of the organic matter was bashed out of that, and there was a lot of it, really a lot of it, um, it ended up very hard set very quickly. Yeah. So it had this 28-year you know, boom of cropping, and then um, and then just a long history of people trying to do the same thing in farming schools. So. You have a similar story that happens through central Queensland with, with um, like Brigolo, like Brigolo suckers, like guys went in there and cleared all that Brigolo, and then grew amazing crops and buffalo grass it was amazing and then now 
the buffalo's looking ordinary and the crops are... Yeah, well, yeah. The, I mean, the brigalows, they're funny because they're, 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 a, they're a, often a, a, a black soil, a vertisol, but the pH range is upside down, so they're really acid underneath. Oh, right. And they're really alkaline on top. And, <coughs> um, and the trees keep promoting the gill guys and turning them over, and they look quite good. And when you clear them, they are so full of nitrogen from those acacias down for metres and metres and metres and metres. Um, yeah. Which is what gives you the super yield. Yeah. Um, and it's really only the people in, the, say, the Golden Triangle in New South Wales who've kept on to their soil fertility issues the whole time that have maintained high productivity, a lot of those guys. But... Um, so what you expect when you clear brigolo and smash it, smash it out flat is a huge bearing production and then it to fall over. Because yeah. brigolo black soils are generally 60 million years old. They're on perisy things. Yeah. They're pretty old and bugged and leached. And the main thing going for them is their huge, um, huge knockback load, yeah. which is, is going to go fairly quickly. And they're pretty prone to structural collapse and what they're just, they're just really old. Mm. And so unless you go in there with a plan from the start to maintain mm. maintain that soil chemistry and soil structure, you're not going mm. to... So I've seen that so many times. Yeah, yeah. It ends up being really abandoned land. Yeah. Mm. So these but, tropical pastures, how long would you say take before they've started to affect the root system, the soil structure, if we were to go straight in tomorrow with a tropical pasture system? Well, they've, they've affected it here. Yeah. So that's two, oh, four, four years. years. Four years. Two years. Uh, two, years ago, two years Two years ago. <laughs> two years ago. Yeah. So impact on soil structure, subsoil structure significantly. <coughs> you're looking at, you know, you know, droughts aside, you're looking at at least seven years to really significantly open up that subsoil. Right. Um, um, yeah, by which stage you've got you know, that tremendous water storage going for you and it'll just keep producing. So you're really looking at a 10 year cycle between cropping? If, if you wanted to go back to cropping, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Um, when you talk about our soils at 60 million years old and 16 million over there in Europe, is theirs going to look like this by uh, the time they get to 60 million years? Uh, or like, okay, oh, that, so, like that down there? Or so or? A, lot of, a lot of European soils are actually less than 18,000 years old. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, it's chalk and cheese. Um, some of the soils in the Hunter are 270 million years old. That's how long they've been exposed. Um, it's, yeah, um, definitely a lot of their soils, particularly if they go hotter and drier, are going to be bloody awful. Um, really, really awful compared, uh, even compared with this. Mm. It's just their climate is driving a completely different system. Mm. And, it, mm. and it's incredible. Um, with the heavy black soils that I've worked with in, um, well, there's one part of Indonesia where I worked where they'd been irrigation farm for 9,000 years. Oh. And the, the guy, the family who'd farmed this little, oh, it's incredible. Like a couple of acres feeds 28 people or plus gives them half of it to sell. And yeah, you know, it's very productive land. but. This guy had farm records going back 1,800 wow. years, yeah. burnt in a Cyrillic script on the tiny slats of wood. It was like, you know, the year the elephant walked past, you know, <laughs> you know 206 AD or whatever. Uh, we planted this, this and this. We got good rain there as well, that, and they were measuring some you know, Asian measurement. Yeah. And um, the guy just had a shelf full of, oh, what's this I hear that the farm records? And he could tell me everything they'd done. Wow, that's and, um, but the, the incredible thing about that to me, his vertisols, his, his black soils, um, can, can I exchange capacity in the Liverpool Plains on a, on a good vertisol that's weathered out of relatively fresh basalt or you know, a nice fresh black vertisol in Horton Valley, any of that? Cation exchange capacity can be 70 or even 150 and sometimes higher. <coughs> His cation exchange capacity had gone down to 20 in that time, so it clearly had an impact, but the soil structure was exactly the same as it was originally, but it was still behaving well. It gave me a lot of hope, actually, for Australian 
agriculture on those heavier soils that you know, here's a, here's a food production system that's really intensive. It's lasted nearly 10,000 years and it's still going well. And if they correct a few small deficiencies and rotate, they're, they're rotating with peanuts and rice there, they're getting, um, they're getting really good results even now. They can't quite get to Australian yields, but they're produced of, of, of rice. Um, Australian yields are sort of around 10 tonnes per hectare and up. Um, they can't get that far, but they're, they're growing up to three crops a year. Mm. So, mm. a very, very different situation to us. Mm. So, the opposite on that, if you take, you mentioned Tassie before. Mm -hmm. right, so, you get that north, west, west corner, like not Stanley, but um, uh, Latrobe, all that through there where you've got um, cattle on exchange of 800. Yeah. What was your view on that, especially with you know, fertiliser and so on? Through there, issues up through there, the binding and so on. Well, mainly phosphorus binding, wouldn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I, I guess go with what's needed in that environment. Um, we did find that in Indonesia, there was a couple of thousand-year-old farms on um, that red red Krasnodar Emi country, like the Austinville Plateau type stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, it was quite depleted, very depleted in pea and really liked to lock onto it. So they, they had a different management system. They, um, and the sad thing was, in a way, that <coughs> because their agriculture is so intensive, they've got no room for animals in their agriculture. So they had no source of dung except for their own to put back into, into the land. So um, if we'd have been there a hundred years ago, people would have had a buffalo. And the... Only the rich people have buffaloes now because you have to buy grass all the time to feed them and people have to climb mountains to cut the grass to carry it down to the buffalo. So um, a tractor costs about a quarter of the price of a buffalo to run in a year. So they have these small tractors that they'll share between 10 people. And, but petrol costs 42 cents a litre. So, yeah. It's funny, but I, I think when they had livestock in their system, they had less of a problem with with things like that. And that's something that's been a big change in the last mm. probably 60 years in that area. Yeah. yeah. So back on this, Rob, we were saying, like Andrew was saying about um, a seven to ten year rotation to get back into cropping. Mm. How long would you want to, if you, if you left a tropical grass stand for say seven to eight years and then you wanted a crop, how many years of cropping before we're starting to really damage before? Not very long. Okay. Not very long. I mean, yeah, you you probably get good yields in your first year or two, and then you'll, you'll end up having structural issues because, um, like I said, when I work with stuff under yeah. the hand, even though it's even though in its dry state it's got great structure, as soon as I smash it up a bit and ground it up in the hand, it turned into slop. Yeah. And that's, no matter how careful you are, so pretty yeah, much gonna, two, two, two cropping years can undo 10 years of yeah. good tropical grass work. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, right. But it, it, it's, it's, well, you know, it, it's also the, um, the value of the pastures themselves compared to what your other activities are. Yeah. Um, dictate that. A lot of people who go to the effort with the tropicals have them in for 30 years or yeah. like, without changing a thing. The only thing that's changed in the last year is um, the mice ate all of the um, flavour seeds, all, all of the legume seeds gone from the Bogabri district. Yeah. And so for the first time in 30 years they've had to direct drill yeah, their, right. their okay. legumes back. So in this, in this country we've got a, like the top 30, it's probably what is it, 2% carbon or something mostly? Less than that, that's the problem. Than, uh, still worthwhile trying to chase that carbon dollar or not? Oh I think so, yep. yep. If, if you come up with a really good plan for managing it, and, make sure uh, and, and you know this is it, it, it's carbon it, the way I look at it is if you, you put in the effort to grow a really good pasture and you started from a low base with the increasing price of carbon in it the odds are it's going to go up to closer to $50 a ton in the next five years um, so if you're only accumulating 10 tonnes of CO2 equivalent, or 20 or 30 tonnes, that's still a significant amount at um, you know, 30 bucks a hectare. Well, we need to be doing it 
for ourselves anyway. But yeah, that's you know, right. And and it's and and so you're doing it to feed cattle. Um, and you might twig your cattle management a bit too, mm. to um, to grow, grow a bit more carbon. But you, your main industry, your, your main business is growing cattle or sheep. But if you're doing it well, I just figure this stuff's a bit of a bonus payment if you're doing it well. And um, and uh, so it's probably worth looking into. It's well, very much, complex to get into at the moment. Be much red tape involved, would there? Sorry. There wouldn't be much red tape involved. <laughs> yeah, they don't even start. It is getting better. Yeah. It is getting better. The new the new carbon process is finally being released in the next month. I've read it. It's, it's a lot better than it was, but it's still very overly sciencey. And you know, the the American you, you can enrol using the American method and stuff here. You'll get paid a lot less. But um. Where people have gone to the effort with doing it with the um, Australian method, there's um, some people have made money already, and uh, there is quite a bit of money to be made. Yeah. But it's it's early days, yeah. And I, I suspect you know some people are going to do it really well, and some people are going to be really disappointed. Yeah. There is some that have been paid for it for stuff that they've already sought. <laughs> yes, like that Wilmont. Yeah, that was. They so, registered though. They registered yeah. years ago. Okay. They were registered. You can't, you can't say, look, I would really love to go to some of my clients' places and and say, look, here's the same pasture under the same management that you've had ever since you got here. Yep. The um, you know, the natives they're doing all right. Here's the organic carbon here. Here's the same soil across the fence under tropicals. Oh goodness, you've got fifty tons of extra carbon. You've done that since you got here. Yep. Um, and you have, but they don't accept that because yeah. they figure that that's already been fixed. They yeah. want more carbon, they want new carbon. Yeah. So, fair enough. Yeah. No, look, um, I, yeah. Look, MLA is pushing for the industry to be carbon neutral by 2030. Um, there's been a lot of um, blowing in the wind, but I think it will be, uh, from my understanding, it will happen. Um, and it's something to think about um, seriously. Um, I've investigated further with certain firms, um, maybe waving the magic wand, but when I look through their employment, um, they've got more lawyers and consultants. I get a bit nervous. Um, so, yeah, there is a lot of red tape. I think it will sort itself out. But in saying that, one of the best sequestration for carbon is pasture. Right? So this is where it's all leading with the tropicals and so on. do it with crops. Yeah. Um, but in point to carbon levels, we're 0 0.8, 0 0.9, right? And so the room to grow is quite big. That's, so yeah. measuring carbon as a percentage doesn't work when you're carbon accounting either. You need to measure your carbon as a percentage of your sample, but you also need to know your bulk density hmm. because you need to be able to convert it into tonnes per hectare of carbon. So. You've measured as, as a percentage, so it's grams per 100 grams of carbon. How heavy is the soil? Yeah. If the soil if the soil weighs um, two ton, uh, sorry, the soil weighs 20 tons per hectare per 10 centimeters, then one percent of that is significant. And if it weighs less, then it's less significant. Mm. Um, one thing that happens with really good management is your bulk density goes down because you're opening the soil up, letting more air in. Um, so what you might find your percentages will go up, but your actual carbon sequestered has stayed the same for the first few years because you've got a higher percentage of carbon in grams per gram, but you've got more air in the soil, so it weighs less. <laughs> and uh, I've done that. There's some trials at Summerton that I'm, yeah. I'm working with the land care group there. Very disappointed after their first couple of years because some of them ended up with half as much carbon as they did before. I said, no, your soil biology is changing. Your soil profile is changing significantly. You watch the next few years. It'll start, it'll start to rocket. Yeah. But it takes time. It's, uh, and, and it's, it's not straightforward. And we do get droughts <laughs> and so on and so forth. So you've got to be very conservative, be a bit conservative about it, but it is worth reading about, it's worth having a go at. 
keeping roots in the ground crop like, you know, as the rain as the rain presents itself. Oh, it probably has. I haven't come across it yet. Okay, so continuous. So bare fallow farming. Yeah. It's going down like that. Yeah. If you've got zero till, it's going down like that. Yeah. Um, even the best zero till out here will barely maintain the carbon that's there. It's always going down. And then you'll reach a point where there's intractable carbon. So a lot of the black soils that have been farmed really hard for 50 years out my way have 0.4, 0.5% carbon. And that's it. It can't go any further because it's sort of, sort of carbon that's very difficult to oxidise. Mm. That's also the type of carbon you want to be putting in and the type of organic matter that you're putting in through your grazing system. Um, yeah, so if you're in colder areas, part, some parts of Victoria and Tassie and a few parts of the Tablelands here, you can use cropping systems to accumulate carbon. You can't here, it's too hot. Simple as that. So you do, you just, it's just like flicking a soil biology switch where um, it, it'll even, carbon will oxidise to the air here without fire. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, just a different system. This is really interesting with the sort of paddock history that's been given. The, the soil structure is fantastic throughout and it's been broken up really nicely. You can see it on both sides of the pit. Um, you've got uh, pasture roots going down to about um, 90 centimetres. I expect the tropicals would way outdo that once you once you establish that, and they've been here for a while. Um, but you can see the structural effect on the soil of the grass roots is fantastic. Again, it breaks up very well into small blocks. The roots are going down the surfaces, which native grass roots do mostly down the surfaces and very few going into the aggregates. They're very fine. They're not as good as getting into the getting into the soil and often you'll find in native grass paddocks you end up with um, um, quite a lot of excess moisture um, in this zone at this time of year because they've facilitated funneling it in but haven't taken off yet. Um, you've got some pretty reasonable structural compaction from stock because it was grazed when it was wet and um, so that's what I was saying you don't need very many passes of this sort of soil to really crunch it down to that hard hard to break stuff again and um, which is why generally this, this sort of soil is generally more suited to to pastures mm. um, because of that structural decline has a you do have a bit of bleach here <laughs> gotcha. there you go. still a bit of bleach in there at the bottom so still very similar to the other soils. The colour's changed, but um, it's, it's still still got that um, silky loam topsoil mm. over quite a heavy clay. Um, that's probably an artefact because most of that bleach has has gone, or is, there's just little bits of it here and there through the profile as you go along. So that's good. The plants have. Um, was it last year? Have, have kept the soil nice native and grass. open. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Plants have kept the soil nice and open, and um, and the the soil has um, you know, stayed up. And as a result, so really good structure, and um, except for the top bit, which is just poached at the moment. Um, How far did the compaction go down from the cattle? Is it far or generally just to the top of the B with this? Right. Here. I've seen it in black soil. Black soil has two compaction zones, right at the surface and then down here. So you'll get it at the surface and then at 80 centimetres. Wow. And it's really weird. I was working on one a farm one day where this guy, for whatever reason, put thousands and thousands of dead on a paddock. And it was really poached on top. Um, but then I was digging out perfect hook prints down at 80 centimetres, like they'd got their legs stuck in it. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah, I don't know why that happens, but it happens with um, uh, vehicles and tractors too. A lot of your compaction in black soils is down at that 80 centimetre layer. And um, it's just something to do with the physics of the soil. But, oh, it was like pulling out a fossil cow print, very weird. <laughs> but you can get, in, in any of these shrinking soil soils, you, you'll get um, compaction here and you may get compaction down here as well. But um, this isn't really an issue. 
at the moment you've got lots of roots going through it as, as grass or whatever you're growing here is going to thicken up on it you're going to have mulch on it you're going to have roots growing back through it but it's not it's not a single solid layer like it was in the cropping yeah. even though it looks like it on top at the moment so it's it's not too bad and, and in fact the soil quality quality underneath is very good plenty of access to nutrients heaps and heaps of moisture um, what makes you in parts that? and if you were to did it yes. <laughs> any of these um what's this oats is that yeah oats. just follow it just the oat root ball down because it's got in good structure follow the oats down where does the shag under that just uh peel that sorry yeah and then it's um and then right next to it, it's quite dry <coughs> so that that's showing you really really well how roots funnel water into the ground yeah, yeah. absolutely amazing because here, here it's quite dry and here it's just mm. it's So with the one thing about this area here, it dries out quick, and that's top 15. Yeah. So by the look, what's going there? There's still a reserve of moisture underneath yes. the plants to survive. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that's <coughs> the advantage of having perennials in a landscape too. Is that they get their roots into the deep water storage, and they, you know, they can just persist and persist and persist. But a lot of your annual things only end up dominating in this bit, yeah. and the they really don't get a chance to use the, the deeper moisture and nutrient storage that the subsoil is offering. So yeah, that's can be um, quite difficult. And interestingly, none of this stuff looks like it's going to disperse. So I yep, suspect right. the top might. Yep. But um, <coughs> yeah, so it's, it's pretty good. It's in pretty reasonable nick. It's um, structurally reasonably stable. Um, and structurally down the profile it's great yeah. and too you hit that yellowy hard stuff which mm. um, the only reason it's probably so hard is there's a bit of a scrape there but um, if you get roots down into that sand in, in, in any significant quantity that'll open up too yeah. which um, new tropicals give you that chance to go yep. um, yeah. Any questions? Hop in actually, because that's really. Yeah, we'll I think everyone should see that one. Um, Rob, tropical grass. Have we got to nuke everything and then get it established, or can we plant tropical? Um, my name's Andrew Jack. I'm a senior agronomist with Hart Rural. Uh, we're based at uh, Manila and Baraba. Uh, we cover country from uh, Tamworth out to here, Upper Horton, and across to uh, Bingra. Uh, we deal with um, mixed cropping, dryland cropping, as well as irrigation um, and pasture. Tropical pastures is our uh, main enterprise here. Uh, today was especially important because uh, we got down back down to the basics. Uh, we actually don't know what the soil constraints have been and the best way of doing that was uh, actually just digging a big pit and uh, getting Rob Banks to come along and give a, a, an independent view of what's been happening with the soil. Uh, luckily with the owners here, uh, with uh, Johnny McDowell and family, they were quite keen to take this on. They've always been looking outside the square to improve their uh, farming operation. And uh, we've had a really good turn up here at the district and we've learned a lot of things about what's happening below our feet, which will help with uh, maintaining a good sustainable production system within the district. Look, it's a large area and we've had a really good turn up and it shows that everyone really wants to know what's happening below their feet and they're really keen uh, to uh, get some answers uh, to how they're going to go ahead uh, within this climate. Uh, there's been a lot of questions asked. I've walked away, I've probably asked too many questions, but there was so much to learn here. Um, if you haven't gone away today with a new perspective on how to handle your farming operation, I'll be very surprised. Mm -hmm.